Hello, Cogno family, and welcome to this special conversation with our 2020 Alumna of the Year. This is a person that I bet you know if you have any ties to Louisville at all, and that is our very own Alice Houston. When I think about different universities and great universities and why do people say they're great, it's really not the bricks and mortar. It's almost always tied to the alumni. What did the students who went to that institution go on and do? And our university, as you know, has produced incredible leaders and continues to do so. So this one is no different. Alice Houston is somebody who deeply cares about the university and about the community. So I think she's an inspiration, certainly to me and to all of the alumni uh, who I hope will listen to this, watch this and enjoy uh, hearing from Alice, her own words of wisdom. She will cringe at by calling it words of wisdom, but they always are. So mm -hmm. welcome, Alice. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Bimpoli. And uh, first of all, let me just thank you, the University of Louisville, the Alumni Association, and everybody in Cardinal Land who had anything at all to do with the, my selection as Alumni of the Year. It is, you know, you can receive a lot of things from a lot of different organizations and individuals, but there's nothing like being honored by the school that gave you so much. And as you know, um, the, I always say that there are three wonderful things that happened in, to, in my life. Right. One was my marriage to Wade Houston. One is the lifelong association I've had with the University of Louisville. And one is the business opportunities that Ford Motor Company um, offered us. But even of those three, the most important is the University of Louisville because they brought Wade Houston to the University of Louisville. So you, you get double, you get a double sampling of good fortune. Uh, I got a double fortune of good fortune for being associated with the University of Louisville. So I am humbled when you think of all of the wonderful people who have been alumni of the year. Um, just to be in that category is so special and humbling. So thank you and thank you Cardinal family for the honor. That's beautiful. And you, I would remind Wade that uh, he owes me finder's fees because if he <laughs> hadn't come here, he wouldn't too. So mm -hmm. um, Alice, tell me a little bit about you. Where did, and then please call me Neely as you do. And <laughs> so tell me a little bit about you. Uh, where did you grow up? What brought you to the university? Yeah, I grew up in uh, the West End of Louisville uh, on a very long block between 32nd and 34th on Grand Avenue, two doors from Muhammad Ali. Ah. In, um, and it was a wonderful block because it had so many wonderful role models. We had principals and teachers and artisans. Um, we had the first uh, African-American race car driver, uh, Joe Ray, and the first uh, African-American um, state senator, Georgia Powers. So it was a very, very special neighborhood. And I grew up in segregated Louisville. Mm -hmm. So I went to Virginia Avenue uh, Elementary School, which is now the West End School, and Duval uh, Junior High, which was in a desolate area that they used to call um, Little Africa. And then I went to Central High School um, where uh, I graduated in 1964. My parents were both educators uh, mm -hmm. who um, taught. My, my father was a coach at Central High School, coach basketball, football. And my mother was a special education teacher um, at first and then went back and got her master's degree and her rank one and ended up teaching during the summer practicum at the University of Louisville. So wow. all, all roads in my life point to the University of Louisville. Um, and then after graduating from Central, I went to Baldwin Wallace College in Berea, Ohio. And mm -hmm. Um, graduated from there in 1968 uh, in Latin American history. I wanted to be a mathematician and I got my first C 
ever, my freshman year. And like many freshmen who, you know, come and they have great expectations of themselves, um, I was scared to death. And so I got out of math and, and then pursued uh, history and uh, Spanish only to come back, and we'll talk about that later, for my love of math, because yep. now what I ended up doing all pointed back to math. So um, I would have some you know, advice later on for freshmen to do, not to do what I did, but you know, failure is something um, that is really kind of not an option if you keep on trying. And so, and oh. after- So very true, so very true. So um, after uh, I graduated from Baldwin Wallace, I, I was a Danford Foundation Fellow in Latin American History mm -hmm. and, and, and attended Vanderbilt University. And, um, <laughs> and, and I was going to pursue um, a career. Uh, my major professor had asked me to go with him to Bogota, Colombia, because he was going to write a book. Um, and I couldn't speak Spanish, but I could read it. So he wanted me to go down with, with him as a research assistant. And so I remember calling Wade and I, we had been dating for about three years. And I called him one Sunday night and I said, Dr. Elguera wants me to come uh, and be his research assistant in Bogota, Colombia. And he listened. And I, I noticed he was really quiet, but uh, and so that was on a Sunday. It was Palm Sunday was the next Sunday. And he came down to Nashville with a ring on that oh. Friday and proposed and, I, and told me that, that I, because we had been dating and it just didn't seem like it was kind of going to go anywhere. Um, and so uh, that kind of derailed uh, my going to Bogota, but it also derailed me finishing my degree at Vanderbilt because we got married and then he got an opportunity to go play ball abroad. And so we ended up going to France, to Strasbourg. Wait, wait, wait. before we go to France, you need to back up for me. Okay. Because, yeah, I'm learning something I didn't know. This is interesting. So tell us, when did you meet Wade and how? Like you certainly, was it in college? Where did you meet? Okay, we actually met, as, as I um, indicated before, my father had been a high school basketball coach. So my mother had grown up as I would enter later in my life as a coach's wife. And so, as you may or may not know, uh, Wade was the first um, African-American to sign. Um, there were three of them that came in that year, but to sign the letter to come to, to come play basketball at the University of Louisville. And so there was a group of uh, African-American businessmen mm -hmm. who wanted to welcome them to the community. So they sent a letter to all the, the uh, Black churches asking them to invite these young men to dinner. And, you know, I am sure that most congregations just listened to that and smiled and wanted to, but not my mother who had been a coach's wife. So she leans over to me and she says, we should invite them to dinner. I said, mama, if you want to invite them to dinner, please invite them to dinner. I always, I already had a boyfriend. So, you know, she was always matchmate, but we ended up inviting them to dinner. I, he was a freshman and I guess I was going into my junior year at, in, um, in high school, and I was a cheerleader at Central, which was a really important thing at that time. So they would come to the games, but I, I will say that we were friends, but in the, um, it must have been the summer of his senior year, uh, 1966, the University of Louisville used to sponsor the Upward Bound program. And I walked into, Really? Oh, that's one. We, I walked into Bigelow Hall and who was going to be one of the counselors but Wade? And I was a counselor. And then we had 100 students. So each counselor had 10, 10 um, students. And for the next 10 weeks, we were locked, literally locked together doing things. Our groups liked each other. 
And by the time we came out of that um, that that summer, uh, we had we were dating. So that was yeah, sixty six. I guess sixty six. Yeah. And then we got married. Matching when you were in high school. And and we got married in sixty nine and went on. um, And then it lived in Europe. And then when we came back um, from Europe, uh, Wade began his coaching career at Aaron's. And I started in 1971 as the director of educational services for the very first office of Black Affairs. And um, I did just did a taping uh, for the, the new Diversity and Equity Center. Um, and just to, to know how far that initiative had, has come, but and, and how important that office was. What what a support center it was. Uh, if you can imagine back in 1971, many of our students at that particular time were first generation college students. And that center, and that's, we were there, we were their uh, academic support, we were their emotional, spiritual, psychological, and it was the one place that they could come and be assured that failure was not an option for them, that everyone in that building was there to make sure that they had all of the supports and the tools, the resources, and um, the guidance. And out of that group came Ralph Fitz, Dr. Ralph Fitzpatrick, um, Blaine Hudson. I mean, when you think about some of the young leaders who have come through that facility, and so now to know that it's going to be able to embrace a wider segment of diversity and inclusion and uh, continue down the path that the University of Louisville has always been known in this community, in this commonwealth, and in this nation. I'm just so proud of uh, what we have been able to accomplish because I know that in addition to being a very beautiful physical uh, edifice and having all the new technologies, having that collaboration and innovation and diversity of thought and um, is going to be so important. And I, I, I just know that there's some great things um, that are going to come out of that. Great things, ideas, innovation, collaboration, and students. And 50 years from now, we'll be looking just like I'm talking about Ralph Fitzpatrick and Blaine Hudson, we will be talking about um, because having the women and all, all the, the different components is going to be wonderful. I could not agree more. And uh, um, by the way, I am planning to get a video with uh, Ralph because his story is so inspiring. And we look at that. And I do agree with you completely. My first semester here, I went over to meet our students in the Multicultural Center. They showed me what shabby uh, buildings it had become. Over time, everything does. So it became my highest priority, Alice, that we've got to do this because they deserve it. And what you're telling me is that it's a place where you feel like you're with family because they support you and they challenge you just like your parents did with you. So tell me about college. What was that like for you going? um, uh, Well, you know what? Uh, Yeah, Baldwin Wallace was a liberal arts school. And if you can imagine, it was 2,000 students and there were only eight African-Americans when I got there. There were 22 when I left. And um, it it was a very special institution though, Um, but I I was not able to bond with it culturally. And academically, it was it was a wonderful, wonderful institution. Mm-hmm. And because um, many of our professors, I mean, our teachers in high school um, were educated, had to go outside of the Commonwealth of Kentucky to be educated. Mm-hmm. They had they were actually educated at IU, Michigan, Columbia, NYU. So they were really being taught by those people who, those individuals who were writing the books. Um, right. So 
say all that to say that Central High School probably had some of the best, we had some of the best teachers growing up so that even though I had grown up in a segregated environment, the combination of the academics that we were able and the emotional support, because, you know, we were taught um, that the cards weren't equal. You know, mm. we weren't going to get 52 cards mm. and we were only going to play with 26, but we could win the game with 26 cards if we knew how to play them. Now, and we believe that now, mm. looking at that now, I know that that's not real. You cannot win probably most games with mm -hmm. 50, when, when the one person has 52 and, and the other has 26. But what it did do is give you a confidence that you could achieve. And it was that confidence that I took to Baldwin Wallace. Um, and so much so that our major, our, our, one of our professors said, are all of the young ladies from Louisville as smart and beautiful as you three. And there were three of us. And, and to this day, he probably thinks, cause he's probably not been involved with a lot of other people, but, um, the, but it was a very, very special, um, special institution. And really- uh, It's a wonderful institution. I'm, I'm very familiar with it. And, and, and tell me, you know, to be able to go to Vanderbilt and, and um, and it's funny how life's like a tapestry. Mm. You know, you have this part of it over here and this part, and at the end, it's this beautiful picture that, that kind of comes together, yeah, so. What was Vanderbilt like? Vanderbilt was, now Vanderbilt um, was a completely different environment for me because my uh, uncle was actually president of Tennessee State. It's not Tennessee State University. It was Tennessee Agricultural and Industrial University at that time. And it's really interesting because when I graduated from um, Baldwin Wallace, I had applied um, and gotten other scholarships, but I selected Vanderbilt because my uncle was president of Tennessee State. My brother was had just finished Meharry Medical School. And so I had family there. So in April, when I made that selection to September, when we started school, that was during the 1968 riots. My uncle had been ousted as president of Tennessee State. My brother had been drafted into the Vietnam War and was <laughs> at Fort Lewis and and there I was at Vanderbilt, but yet I, because I had spent every summer in Nashville, um, uh, I, I was still comfortable and mm -hmm. I knew the community. I knew that, and that was a very activist um, time. And Nashville was the epicenter of, 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 of all activism during that time. And so um, I, I remember, uh, even in, in my selection in, in Latin American studies, I was doing uh, my master's on slavery in Colombia. That's why I, I guess Dr. Elguero was going to take me um, to Colombia. And I had, I had seen myself probably uh, because I had done a semester at the United Nations at Drew University during my junior year in at Baldwin Wallace, I tell people until I met Wade, I probably was going to be Condoleezza Rice. I had aspirations. <laughs> That's lovely. And I was curious about the experience because um, Congressman Lewis in his books talks so much about what Nashville was like at that time and it how was actually the, the, the center of activism in the country. And so and I remember um, um, there were not many, you know, African Americans um, in graduate school at Vanderbilt. And so there was a, a dormitory. Mm -hmm. And I remember walking down the hall um, to the bathroom, because you know, you didn't have wonderful suites and things like we have now, where we have rooms with bathrooms. You know, you had this this one uh, 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 restroom with the showers, and so I had. You, know, you have your robe on and you have your towels and you think and there was this young lady walking behind me so close and I turned around I said can I help you 
and she was from Mississippi. She became one of my best friends. Hmm. She said, what's wrong? She said, I wanted to know if you had a tail. I, and no, but, but, but wait. And I said, a tail? Because, you know, I've been in Ohio, you know, I, I, had, I had grown into a, a different kind of person, even though uh, I was back, back now in Nashville. And she said it, Neela, with such sincerity that you knew she was not being malicious. Mm -hmm. And I said, no. And I said, and I said, come on down in my room. And we sat down and we talked and she ended up going out to me that night to a rally at Fisk University. Well, by the time we got home, she was in tears. And I told her, now, look, you cannot take all the responsibility of this on you. But she became one of my very best friends. And, and then you realize that so much of what even happens now is, is out of misinformation, disinformation, you know, and... Um, as I say sometimes, all of us have been omissive, commissive, and permissive. Oh, but, I love that. But, and that's why I'm going back to the, the diversity uh, uh, center, multicultural center. I think that that's what, what's so important about that is it's a place where people can get together and have honest um, discussions about things. But Nashville was a very special place, and it still is. Um, as I think that many institution in many places are so special because of the role that the institutions have played in in, in, in the development of, of the community but oh, but let me let me let me continue my walk down memory lane with the university though okay so now we're at the university of louisville you have all this university of louisville and we're in the office of uh black affairs and um and, and and that was a wonderful um, experience. What for made me. it? Wonderful. What made it wonderful? Because of the students, hmm. because of their eagerness to learn, to do, to succeed, to make a difference. Because this is just you know sixty eight seventy one. They're they're oh. coming out of the conflict of the Vietnam War, there was a lot going on. Uh, you know, they had been uh, not, uh, 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 the, well, they, uh, uh, in the assassination of Dr. King, there was a lot of going of things going on. And so in their minds, they were trying to sort things out. And the ability to help them do that while almost being uh, their same age. Mm -hmm. So they're, you know, right. You're young enough to relate, mm -hmm. but having been through the segregation to the north, back to the, putting the whole picture together for them and walking through history with them was 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 beneficial for me, and it was beneficial for them. And so while I was doing that, it became evident that probably uh, history wasn't the best utilization of my talents. Mm -hmm. And so uh, in helping our students, I went down to, um, to help them fill out financial aid forms and went through ETS and, and uh, learned how to do it. So one day, two years after, three years after that, Dean Dave Lawrence, who is Jennifer Lawrence's uh, grandfather, who was the Dean of Students, and Blake Tanner, who was the director of financial aid, walked across campus and they said, we want you to be assistant director of financial aid. Hmm. I said, I don't have any financial aid experience. And they said, but, but, but we had formed a great relationship because I would help our students fill out the financial aid form. So we did have, and they knew that I was probably the only person in June that he could find that had actually taken a course to help fill out financial aid forms. Now you're so, being deprecating. I'm sure it was more. Uh, and so 
I, I, he hired, Blake hired uh, two people then, Janine Hensley and me as, the, as two assistant directors. And we always said we needed to go back and look at those awards we made that year because nobody knew really knew what they were doing. But that began, that started, I guess I started there in 73 and didn't leave until for 15 years to 1988 when I left, when we started the business. Um, and that was probably the, the best job I have ever had because it allowed me to use my mathematical skills. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We brought up a computerized system during that time uh, that interfaced with the registrar's office, the financial aid office. And I was part of that collaborative team um, that did that. And it was at that point that I decided I was going to drop all illusions of, of completing my master's at Vanderbilt, which they always wanted me to do. I bet they did. Mm -hmm. And so I ended up transferring the six hours, the basic that they give you, even not the 30, and starting all over in college student personnel. Hmm. Um, and... Uh, we had, I had a professor, Dr. Well, he really wasn't a PhD, William McLaughlin, who taught um, a, a course in education. Mm. And he, he, and I will never forget that course because he talked about the purpose of higher ed education. Is it utilitarian huh. or is it liberal arts? And it's so funny, 40 years later. <laughs> Any discussions? We're still having the same discussion of whether what is the purpose of a higher education is it utilitarian or uh, is it for liberal arts? And so I ended up getting my um, degree in college student personnel, which was heavily at that point um, centered on guidance and counseling. And the preparation of guidance and counseling combined with math technology. At that point, I didn't understand how I was really being prepared to enter the business arena. That so talk about that. That's a perfect segue to talk about that. So UFL looks like the university gave you extensive job experience in listening to students, helping them, as well as your education. And so how did the leap to business happen? Well, the leap to business happened um, going back to, to kind of to Wade. Uh, Wade grew up in Alcoa, Tennessee. And if anybody can lump those names together, Alcoa Aluminum was known for an aluminum plant. And his father and mother, neither one um, attended college, but they were the most wise people I have ever known or been around. Mm -hmm. Because of the um, aluminum, uh, the, the, the aluminum company, they were on strike a lot. And, you know, when you're on strike, you had, mm -hmm. you, you, you get to know peanut butter and steel. I mean, and uh, and cheese and a lot of things that as a child, you don't want to grow up and have to do again yes. or have your children doing. Mm -hmm. And so Wade had always, always, always wanted to be an entrepreneur, mm -hmm. but he never wanted to leave coaching at the university to be the entrepreneur. Um, and so we went through a series of things that didn't go quite well. Um, we had a grocery store in 1979, uh, 80, when the interest rates went up to uh, 20 and 21%. Um, we had a little uh, uh, thing called Sandy Seat when there was a herpes virus. So he was gonna mix together these things to, to sanitize um, things that so people wouldn't get um, infections. Long story short, we were in business, but not in business, right? We Neither one of us were going, to, I wasn't going to leave financial aid and he was not going to. Um, and so those things didn't go 
very well or turn out very well. But in in about 1982 or 1984, Ford Motor Company, as part of their diversity initiative, um, really had a plan in which they wanted their supplier base to look like their customer base. And they were very intentional mm -hmm. about um, engaging minority vendors. And um, the research will show that, especially during that time, the automotive industry probably produced, mm -hmm. produced more uh, minority and women-owned businesses and, and millionaires than any other industry in and of itself. Um, and so, interestingly enough, there was a purchasing manager at Ford Motor Company named Arnie Silvers, and he was a huge when I say huge University of Louisville fan, he was a huge University of Louisville fan. And so when Ford came up with this initiative, he didn't know any African-Americans. And so the most visible Af African-American he knew in Louisville, Kentucky during that time was Wade Houston because of the 1980s and oh, our friends in basketball, right? So he called Wade and asked him, did he know anybody who might be interested in getting into transportation. And Wade said, no, but he would check on it. Well, Arnie kept calling and calling and calling. And, and, and I, don't, I don't think that he, even he knew at that particular point he was recruiting us, but mm -hmm. he kind of was. I think he, he was reaching out to whom he knew. Mm -hmm. And I love to tell this story because if I went to Ford Motor Company today and asked them, anything about Arnie Silvers, nobody in the world probably at Ford would know it. But here's a man who took an organization's mission and goal to mm -hmm. one person. So one person can make a difference. Right. Who actually reached out, put that mission or strategy in effect, and in doing so, made a huge, huge difference in this family's life and the community's life as we've been able to, you know, ultimately go on and employ people and, and give back in the best manner that we can. Um, so there again, the university uh, uh, and business certainly came together. The transition to business was probably not as difficult as it might have been if I had not been on this journey <laughs> in preparation um, through counseling and, and that's made it, you know, listening to people and then um, the financial aid background and the technology background. But what we didn't have at that particular time was role, model, role models or, or mentors because we were going down a path that not, I don't know anybody else had gone down the path. And it was always so surprising to me as a woman in, in the trucking industry, I come back and I say, wait, they all know who I am. He said, why do you think they know who you are, Alice? You're the only woman in the group, in the whole. And so I think that's one reason why even today, and you probably know that, I mean, now how, how, you are a role model and a mentor to so many people and young women. Um, and, and that's why we try to spend time in, in mentoring, in answering questions, because I can remember um, the days in a room thinking, what am I going to do? And I think the scariest moment I had, and I laugh now, was a young lady came in my office and she, she was so happy, she said, Miss Houston, we, we're going to buy a house. We're going to close on a house Friday. And I said, you're going to close on a house? And I kept thinking, you're going to close on a house based on decisions I'm going to make. In this. <laughs> you're talking about a humbling, scary yep. moment uh, when you, you, you think that you, you really are impacting other people's lives. And especially when... Um, there are not a lot of people that you at that time could seek information and counsel. And I think that's where faith comes into, you know, you just, you just pray and you, 
You have faith that you're doing the right thing and you're doing the best thing that you can. But as far as the actual transition, um, it was not probably as bad as it would have been had we not had all of these other experiences along the way. And then we always um, had great teams around us. You know, we were we were fortunate to early in our, our careers to um, get good attorneys and accountants and um, and even now, you know, one of the best decisions that we that Conrad, our son-in-law, did because he's now the president and Lynn, our daughter, is the uh, CEO. But he got us engaged with the University of Louisville Business Center uh, uh, Family uh, Council, and so that we've been a member of that for four or five years, and. Um, that has been any any family business that's not taken advantage of that is really um, the family business center is really m missing out on a jewel of an opportunity. Um, and that's why, you know, having the university as the anchor in this community is so important. Um, and I, I don't think that we probably um, brag enough about our role in community. I, I thank you so much, Alice, for saying that. I think uh, both are very, very true. The Family Business Center and um, YUM is actually stepped up to help the University of Louisville so that we can support a lot of entrepreneurs who are black and brown and may not have role models. It's actually going to help every entrepreneur, but particularly at this time in Louisville, to yeah. say, have an idea, uh, a way to help them think through how to pursue that entrepreneurship. So yeah. I think that's, that's, um, that's terrific. Um, let me ask you, let's go back to the topic of failure. You mm -hmm. talked about uh, how, whether it was your first C, that then you said, okay, I've got to quit this, or the business failures. For a young person, what advice would you give if they had a C, but they love a topic? What do you think they should do? Oh, they they've got to pursue it. You know, um, you know, failure is part of life. Um, and a C is really not a fa failure. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I when I look back at that now, uh, I don't know what the path would have been if I had not given up, and I can't question that. But I know that that the love of math was central to who I was, mm -hmm. and I would, and I admire, and I encourage young people. Part of education is, and that's why we talk about liberal arts and utilitarian. Part of this is exploring who you are and what your interests are. And you know, there are many times I, I don't know of a successful person who, if they were really true truly told their story, would not include in that narrative the things that didn't go right. That's why I'm so inter always interested in when people uh, introduce people and they, they start at the most successful part of their life, but the learning, the growing, um, the figuring out what you is, is kind of like trial and error. So I would encourage um, I, I would really encourage young people to stick with it. Now, there's going to be a time where you say, okay, maybe this is not for me, but it's not at the first time that you meet adversity. Because remember, you're coming to a new situation and you may have been the top of your class or uh, the most popular or w in your own environment. Now you're in a different environment and you need to take this opportunity to try on new clothes, <laughs> new ideas and, um, and and see 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 what what is really in course in store for your life because I assure you you're gonna learn more from, those challenges than um, just sailing, sailing through. Um, what motivates you, Alice? You do so much. So what is it that gives you strength and keeps you going? I think, first of all, um, it, it was probably 
how I was brought up. I was brought up in a coach's household when everything was going on and, and we were, and there were a lot of people in our house. There was always a lot of activities. So I think it is the love of, of, of people and of doing. And it's, there's also a curiosity and I like to meddle. So I like to be involved. Um, it's just, I don't well, yes. Okay. All right. <laughs> I just like, like I like life and I, I really enjoy seeing individuals um, flourish and be the best that they can be wow. and, and, and give an encouragement. Mm -hmm. yeah. So part of what we are doing to go, you know, doing obviously at the University of Louisville, we still have the opportunity of serving so many who are low income or first generation. Our mission hasn't changed. As you say, some things seem to be a fight that's not for a season, right? You got to keep at it for a while. But it really motivates me. 40% or so of our students are Pell eligible, which you know very well what yes. it means, how it gets them there. Yeah. Uh, so advice to them. Any advice to them and closing thoughts from you? Well, I think the, the advice to them is to really take advantage of every single opportunity um, that they have, um, to not be um, scared to ask for help. This is what institutions of higher learning are all about. Um, and sometimes we're so reluctant to say, I need help. I don't understand. Mm -hmm. um, is there a resource that I can uh, attach? Is there a person, a mentor? The, the biggest thing is to keep putting their foot forward one day at a time and to be aware, uh, to make good choices, to make good choices of friends, to make good choices of their surroundings, of their activities, but to stay engaged with an institution um, and just to be involved and to, 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 to know that in the final analysis, if they do their part, the institution will do our part and the community will do our part. And we're all in this together. And, and to realize that they really are the, the, they're the future. No so they, they, they have to participate, engage, sacrifice, lead, so that they can leave a legacy for themselves and for their family and for the community and for this nation who probably needs them more at this time than ever before. Beautiful, beautifully said. I could not agree more with you. And Alice Houston, congratulations. Thank, Thank you. you for the time today. And I am so excited for our Cultural and Equity Center Thank so you. that that can be the place that every student knows if they need a place where their family, you're invited, you're welcomed, as you are, and you will get that support. Hopefully that will be the place where if a student is struggling, they will say, what do I do? They know yeah. there's one place to go. That's, that's terrific. We are so proud of you and Thank so you. honored. And we'll all remember to love life and love people and to make a difference. Yeah. Thank you. Good trouble. Uh, Alice Houston has now coined good meddling. That's good. <laughs> And so you've got to throw up your L and say, go cars from the Cardinal Fair. Go yeah, cars. That's it. That's right. 